Welcome everyone to today's core training on using core tools to develop your proposals. I'm Nicole Lezen, one of the local consultants who facilitates a countywide initiative called Collective of Results and Evidence-Based or Core Investments, along with Nicole Young. We're your hosts and trainers for today. And as you can hear, our core institute events are held bilingually in English with Spanish interpretation, thanks to our team members, Stella Larman, who provides simultaneous interpretation and translates all of our core materials, and Gisela Carrasco, who's providing consecutive interpretation right now, and will also translate any comments and questions you may have in the chat. So I'm going to turn things back over to Nicole Young, and she's going to start us off with a poll. Great. Thanks, Nicole. It's good to see everyone here today. And we wanted to find out first, before we just start, before we start describing these tools, we want to get a sense of how many of you have used these tools at least once? Some of them are relatively new. We've done core coffee chats and trainings in the past on these tools. We want to get a sense of, of this group today. How many of you have used these core tools at least once? And you can choose as many that apply to you. The core results menu, strategies and program outcomes menu, the core continuum of results and evidence, the promising practices database, or none of the above. So we'll uh, give it like another 30 seconds maybe, just to make sure everyone has had a chance to answer, and then I'll close the poll and share the results and see what we're, what we're working with today. Okay, looks like the results have slowed down and stopped. So here we can see that some of you, um, at least one or two of you have used each of the tools listed. Several of you have not used any of them yet. So great, it's perfect that you are here today. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing those results and keep moving on to give you a sense of what we're gonna cover today. So we'll do our usual short overview of core investments. And then we're calling it a guided tour of these core tools. Um, there are four different ones that we wanna cover today. These are four different tools that are actually mentioned in the core investments request for proposals or RFP. That's why we wanna make sure that <clears throat> you know where to find them, you have a sense of how to use them. Uh, we're, we'll encourage you to try using them as we're talking about them, or we'll, we'll give a little bit of time to have you practice using them. Um, but also, if you are brand new to these tools, I'll just say you'll probably want to spend more time diving into these after this training. We won't, we may not be able to um, cover all of them in as, as much depth uh, as you would like to today. So we encourage you to keep going back to them and try them out, especially as you're preparing your proposals. And then we'll finish up with any lingering questions before we close and talk about next steps and what else is coming up. Before we dive into our content, we wanna just take a moment to ask that everyone follow a, a, a handful of agreements so that we have a, what we call a brave and inclusive learning space. That we recognize that for some of you, these may be things that you've heard before, have tried out before, and you're just here for a refresher. Others might be feeling like, whoa, this is all new and it's a lot. We wanna make sure it feels like an inclusive learning space for everyone. So we just ask everyone to share the air, just it means being being aware and mindful of how much time and space you're taking up either asking questions or or sharing your thoughts in the chat we want to have a chance to hear from everybody we encourage you to lean into discomfort and take risks so again if you're someone that's hearing this today and you're feeling like well that's so much information uh when would i ever find the time to take this all in and really understand how to use these that's what we mean by that kind of discomfort. Just you know, sit with it for a while, take in as much as you can today. And again, we encourage you to just continue going back to the tools and trying them out and seeing what of it would be useful to you. I encourage you to speak from your own experience. So if you've used these tools before, please feel free to share that and what you found helpful um, or not as helpful. Um, and just remember that uh, we can all learn from each other's experiences but that we might have different experiences as well. So what may work for one person may not work as well for someone else. Um, 
we ask everyone to listen fully and be present. We encourage you to turn your cameras on. Uh, we like we love talking to other people's faces uh, in this virtual environment. Um, there will be times when we'll ask you questions or encourage dialogue. So we again love to have people be present and feel like we're not just talking to ourselves. Um, we encourage a learning mindset, stay curious, call each other into the learning process versus calling each other out and making each other feel silly or wrong for not knowing something and to separate and, and be mindful of the difference between intent versus impact in terms of what we say and how we say it. Um, to honor confidentiality in these trainings uh, and in the other technical assistance sessions that we're offering related to this core application process. Some people are sharing information about their ideas for their proposals. They're sharing some of their struggles that they're having, both with the application as well as maybe just programmatically. We encourage that kind of sharing because it helps us figure out how to use these tools or how to apply them to real life situations. But we also ask everyone to honor that confidentiality. Um, and so also just be, be aware, remember that we're recording this. So just only share what you feel comfortable sharing uh, in this training session. And then last but not least, practice self-care. Uh, I know that for so many of us, there's so much going on, so many things to juggle. Uh, it can get overwhelming at times. We encourage you to do what you need to do to stay in your learning zone and take care of yourself. That's how we keep going. So I'll just pause there for a moment and, and check to see, do these sound like agreements that everyone can follow for today and help each other remember? Thanks, Chris, for that thumbs up. Others can give a thumbs up on screen or virtually. That's really helpful. Thanks, Eduardo. Okay. Is there anything anyone wants to add to this list before we continue? Either unmute or add it to the chat if something comes to mind. Thanks for that thumbs up, Kevin. Okay, we'll call these agreements then and we'll keep moving on. And again, we'll help each other remember them if needed. So the brief overview of core investments, again, think of core as both a funding model and a movement really centered around equitable health and well-being using a results-based collective impact approach with this mission and this vision at the center. And the mission and vision you'll see really focus on safety, health of the community, equity, resilience, shared responsibility. So we, we show these, we try to remind ourselves of these every time we have these learning opportunities together. And when we talk about equitable health and well-being, we talk about equity at the center of creating and connecting these eight core conditions for health and well-being. Um, and we just, all, again, always remind ourselves of how interconnected and interdependent they are, um, that we it's very hard to talk about health and wellness uh, separate from a safe and just com community or economic security and mobility. So uh, just, that's kind of the key theme to remember there, how connected they are with equity at the center. And in fact, if you haven't seen it already in the core request for proposals, it actually talks about equity and provides a way of thinking about equity, particularly as you're preparing your applications. So here, it's this is a direct quote from page two of the RFP, just talking about how central equity is to the to core overall, and that equity is both a process and a desired impact that focuses on anti-racism and racial equity explicitly, but not exclusively. And so again, when we think about the core conditions, equity at the center, we really mean creating uh, systems and practices and policies that foster equitable opportunities for health and well-being so that opportunities and outcomes aren't limited or predicted by things like age, race, ethnicity, immigration status, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so those and all of these trainings and technical assistance sessions, the core coffee chats, core conversations, all of that is offered under this umbrella of the Core Institute for Innovation and Impact. Okay, so that's our quick overview of Core. So again, here's what we will guide you through this tour over the next uh, hour or so of the core results menu is where we'll start. 
And then we'll talk about a particular tool called the Strategies and Program Outcomes Menu, and the Core Continuum of Results and Evidence, and then the Promising Practices Database. And as we go through these, I'm going to actually stop sharing my screen at this point, uh, because Nicole and I will be taking turns uh, demonstrating how you find these tools, how you use them. They're all located and housed on DataShare Santa Cruz County. And so then as we talk about each tool, Gisela will also post the link in the chat about how you get to those tools. So let me stop my screen share now. And actually, I'm going to start a new screen share with website here. Okay, so starting with the core results menu, um, you know, as I mentioned, or as I showed on a slide a little a uh, few moments ago, this concept of the core conditions of health and well-being are really central to core investments overall to the framework. And so we wanted to provide some ways to think about how do you, you know, how, how do you know whether we're getting closer to equitable health and well-being in those eight core conditions? So there's two different ways, a couple different ways you can get to this core results menu. You can either just Google it, core results menu data share, and you'll see, especially if you include those particular words, the first uh, search result that is returned is the core investments menu. And I see someone's asking for um, bigger font. So let me increase this. How's that? Is that better? Okay. Just tell me if something needs to be bigger. Okay. So you can either Google it and get to it that way. And if you click on that link, here's where it takes you. So you'll see this is on DataShare Santa Cruz County, which itself is an online platform that has all kinds of uh, local data. But today we're going to focus on these tools that we've housed within DataShare uh, related to CORE. And so here you'll see the description of CORE, the vision, mission, and values, and the core conditions that I just mentioned. There are some other links to other tool, the other tools that we're going to cover today. So I'll wait before I click on those. And then this is what we call the core results menu. So the idea is that, you know, if you're doing some program planning, maybe designing a new program, trying to think about how to evaluate either a new or existing program, or just figure out how to communicate the connection between what you do and the desired impact at a community level, that might happen through delivering programs or implementing new policies or funding certain things, that this can be a tool to help you identify and communicate that. So we like to say, you know, start off by asking what community impact or result do you want to achieve or contribute to in one or more of the core conditions for health and well-being? So you'll see here that the way that the, the menu is organized is, again, by core condition. There's one kind of box for each of the eight core conditions. And in each one of those, you'll see a set of what we're calling community impact statements. So you'll see in some of the core conditions, like in health and wellness, there are four impact statements. Lifelong learning has more. There are five here. Some of them have fewer, like Thriving Families has three. And I'll just mention that, that we went through a pretty extensive process to develop this core results menu, not only deciding what to call these eight core conditions, but deciding which community impacts to include, how to phrase them, and then what indicators or types of data uh, should be clustered within each community impact statement. So I'll show you an example here in health and wellness. I'm just going to click on this first one, equitable access to affordable quality care. So if I click on that link, it takes me to a page here where I can see I'm still in the health and wellness core condition. I'm looking at indicators related to the first impact statement. 
And then I can see a few different like dashboards for some more specific indicators like insurance coverage rates. So basically think about like if we were, you know, if you were interested in saying, you know, our work, our program contributes to equitable access to affordable quality care at a community level, then the next question would be, well, what, how would you know whether that's happening? What kind of data at a community level would tell you the current state of that access in the community and whether or not trends are moving in the right direction or whether there's an area of concern? So some of the indicators would be ways to, to understand the status of equitable access to affordable quality care. So here we have insurance coverage rates, access to a usual source of care. And so you can see that for those two indicators, there's data available. We know that because there are these dashboards here and there's a button here that says see more data. And I'll click on that in a moment. As you explore the core results menu, you'll see other areas, not only in this core condition of health and wellness, but in others as well, that we may have an indicator listed there because somewhere along the line in, in drafting the core results menu, <clears throat> uh, someone suggested and others agreed that, oh, that would be a useful indicator to measure and track, see what's happening at a community level. But if you see the statement here, data unavailable at this time, it means that there isn't an actual data source available for that indicator. So we wanted to list it in the core results menu to show that that was of interest or uh, some felt it was you know, a priority, but we just have to do more work to figure out, is it possible? Is there a data source? Can it be added? Okay. So again, for some core conditions, some impact statements, you, you may see that data unavailable at this time show up in a number of places. But other indicators, you'll see the button here that says see more data. So like, for instance, if I click on this one for insurance coverage rates, again, tells me I'm in health and wellness, still in impact one. Now I'm looking at more specific data for health insurance coverage rates. This one actually has data about adults, about children, about you know type of health insurance, in this case, private versus public. So again, some indicators in data share in this core results menu will have data available at that kind of level of detail. Others, it's, you know, there's, there are some clear gaps there. Uh, I'm gonna show you another example. And I'm just gonna go back to the starting page here. You know, the, uh, look at another example here under thriving families. And I'm gonna choose uh, this third impact statement here that says increased resilience among older and, and dependent adults. I'm gonna click on that one to see what comes up. So again, I can tell I'm still in Thriving Families, looking at impact three. So there are a couple indicators here specific to people over age 65 or older adults. Uh, things like geographic isolation and self-reported general health assessments. And then this is one where you can see indicators that um, as we were developing the core results menu, these were suggestions about, oh, it'd be great to have some data or to be able to find community level data on these indicators. You can see we've got some more work to do to try to fill those data gaps. Okay. If I click on <clears throat> geographic isolation, for instance, to see more data, this one takes me directly to the indicator data in DataShare. This is, DataShare is basically a whole bunch of data pages like this for uh, hundreds of indicators. Okay. So this one, I clicked on that, see more data, on that button, this one took me directly to that data point. And it tell each each indicator that's in data share will have it'll look similar. It'll have things like a description at the top here about why is this important? Why is that data point? Why is that indicator important? Um, I won't read this all out loud to you today, but if you look at this and if you look at any of the indicator, any of the other indicators you're interested in and read the why is why is this important? 
that might give you some helpful language to use as you're creating a theory of change or as you're um, preparing your narrative responses for the core application or any funding application. There's usually a, you know, some kind of question about what's the need, why is this an issue, uh, who's experiencing it more, where are their disparities or particular concerns or barriers. So you might find sample language in the data share indicators that can help you articulate that need, that concern, disparities. The data, each of these indicators will also tell you the original data source, where is this data originally coming from? Uh, it'll tell you when the data that's, that's displayed, when it was last uh, collected, what is the most recent data point, and who's keeping the data updated in DataShare. In this case, it's Conduit Healthy Communities Institute, which is, they, they basically uh, kind of own and manage this whole platform. And how, when was the last update made? Sometimes you will see indicators that uh, can be broken out by not only change over time, but they might have uh, breakdowns by race and ethnicity. They might break down age ranges more specifically, sometimes by gender. So sometimes that's what we call uh, disaggregating data. So it might be available on data share in that way, but not always. Um, some data might only be available at a county level, countywide. Other data, like in this case, you can see is available by census place. So I'll click on that and you'll see then not only a map appear with the darker shades, meaning a higher percentage of people 65 and older who are living alone. And it tells you then over on this side, the bar chart, the names of those census places. So basically like cities, towns, you can also view it by zip codes. And so again, in some cases, data on data share is available at that level of specificity. Other times it's just countywide, no breakdowns available by race or ethnicity or age or things like that. And I see the question from Lisa in the chat about for your core applications, are you limited to targeting these indicators? No. So this, think of this as, uh, that's why we call it a menu. <laughs> it provides possible options. It may be helpful for you if you're looking for, oh, how do I phrase that? How do I show that it's connected to a core condition? Uh, you will be required in the core applications to select or, or show or say which core condition your proposed program or service is primarily related to. And so then when you do that, you may find it helpful then if you're trying to figure out how do you draw, connect the dots between the core condition and your program outcomes and, and make the case about why that's necessary or why that would be valuable in the community, then uh, you might find, or we hope that you'll find, you know, a community impact statement and some indicators that would be useful to you as you're trying to make that case. But no, if there's something, if you, want to include something in your proposal and you don't find it anywhere in this menu, feel free to like, put it in your, in your applications. And then let us know. Let us know if there's something that you wish were in this core results menu, but you don't see there yet. And we um, can try to get that added in a future iteration. Okay, so that's, I think, the end of my demo in terms of what I was going to say. So we wanted to give everyone a, a chance to try this out yourselves. So if you uh, haven't already, go ahead and click on that link to the core results menu that Gisela put in the chat. I'll stop my sh screen share for a second just so it doesn't get confusing about what you're, <laughs> what you're looking at or what you're navigating. And try to find, pick a core condition. Maybe it's, if, it's, if it helps to pick something that you're actually thinking of applying for in your core proposal. Try to think about, okay, which core condition would that relate to? See if there's an impact statement that feels like it would align with or relate to what you're proposing. And see if you can find an indicator, a data point that you think could be useful to you as you're making the case for that and you're describing the need in the community. 
related to that proposal. We'll give you a few minutes to do that and then we'll see if anyone would be willing to share, just tell us out loud what you found or even share your screen and tell us how you got there. Okay, I love that I'm seeing some faces that look like they're concentrating hard and <laughs> hopefully finding what's interesting and relevant to your proposals. Did anyone find something that they feel is useful, relevant, could be something that you could incorporate into your core application? I just found, uh, and maybe this is going one step further, but the strategies and well, through multiple clicks here, I guess I ended up on a page through strategies and program outcomes and promising practices. And that promising practices uh, page, I guess, or that's, this is perhaps a whole separate part of the search, but that's um, really interesting to me just to see what stuff is happening. We can search locally um, for examples. And I guess I'm not totally sure what some of the other CDC community guides and new practices, but it's kind of cool to have some case studies for me. That's really helpful. Yeah, so that's that. That'll be the last tool that we'll cover today. So that's great that you found it already. And that's um, that's how we tried to structure the whole course results menu that, you know, you might land on one thing and then it, and then you, and then you see the strategies and outcomes button at the bottom of every page. So it can kind of guide you through all the tools as you're, depending on what you're looking for. So Kevin, we'll come back to you when we get to the to that tool to, to hear what you hear what you found and what what was useful about it. What about anyone else in the find anything that you found relevant, useful in the core results menu as you were clicking through the community impact statements and indicators? Or or are you trying to find something and, and feeling like, I can't find it anywhere. Is it on here? Yeah, Chris, go ahead. Well, I, just, I have a question. If we start from that menu and go to all of these indicators and look through them, will that take us to every, to all of the data in data share? Or is there a lot more that's not going to show up by going through those indicator sites, pages? We have tried to make sure that every indicator in data share is matched to a core condition in the core results menu. But I know that data has continued to be added to data share. And so that's something that I think we probably have to check to make sure that they're getting <laughs> connected in the right place in the core results menu. Um, but also, and I'll just show you, um, there are other ways that you can also view data if you're trying to get a better, like an overall sense of like what is in data share and you don't want to have to click through every, you know, core condition and every impact statement. There are a couple different ways to find data on data share. Um, some of my go to, like if I'm just trying to see, does that indicator exist in data share? Um, I often go to data, interact with, no, sorry, view data indicators by location level, because not only does that show you all, the whole list of everything that's in data share, and these are in the blue bars here. This is how data share categorizes the indicators. So it's slightly different labels than the core conditions, but you can more easily get that bird's eye view of what is available and at what location level, like how granular can you get with the uh, data in terms of location. Could you real so quick if you're, show how you got there again? Yes. So. Let's say I'm on the home page. If I go to the data menu, view data, 
And then, so it's like a couple sub menus, indicators by location level. And, uh, and we've done a couple other trainings on data share. We can, we can um, certainly talk about this more in either other office hours or like if, if, if anyone's wanting to really understand how to use data share and kind of navigate around. It's a great tool. It does, you know, take some time to get familiar with it and, and figure out what is the fastest way to get to what I need. But I, I find this one really helpful to kind of figure out so I'm not having to, you know, click through every single thing to, to know whether or not it's available. Okay, any other questions about the core results menu? Okay, then I'm gonna turn it over to Nicole, who's gonna show us the next tool. Thanks, Strategies Nicole. Programs outcomes. And Kevin mentioned the um, next couple of tools. And so I'm gonna share my screen and hope that everyone is seeing that. So this is the um, the way to get to the strategies and program outcomes page. So if you're already on the results menu, you just can scroll down. If you're not, uh, if you're not remembering how to get there from the way the, the path that Nicole Young just showed you, the core results menu is under the local progress pages. Um, so that's another way to get to this, to where I am right here on the, um, the core results menu. But if you scroll down the core results menu, you'll see, as Nicole mentioned, links embedded in here for the strategies and program outcomes and the promising practices that was just mentioned that we're gonna to get to in a minute. But there's also a button at the bottom, this nice orange button that's a little easier to see. So I'm just gonna click on that, but they're just as with other websites, there are usually multiple ways to get to where you wanna go. And some are more direct than others, but it's trying to anticipate just what, what was described about wandering through the results menu. And maybe you get to the end of it and think, hmm, that's interesting. I wonder what this is. Or maybe you have that thought earlier on when it's being described. But either way, you can get to this strategies and program outcomes page. And so in response to Lisa's question earlier as well, the intent of this tool is also not to be prescriptive. So you don't have to choose something in this menu when you're preparing your core proposal. But the examples are, are meant to just stimulate some ideas, give you a sense of what's possible if, if you don't already have something in mind, or even if you do already have something, but you might want to refine it. So you may choose to group or categorize or label these things differently. These are just examples of how we have done this, how we have learned from others to do this. And so just feel free to use this as a starting point or if it's not helpful to you to not use it. But we hope you will find it helpful in answering in the first part of, of these strategies about where you're focusing your efforts, especially with a diversity, equity and inclusion lens. And this is particularly helpful to ask early on in a process. So for example, maybe when you're creating something new from scratch, writing a grant proposal like the core RFP um, applications or um, doing different kinds of planning efforts or fine tuning um, budgets, looking for partners for different things. There are a variety of situations other than submitting a proposal where this can be helpful. And so under the strategies, we've suggested um, different types of answers to focusing your efforts. And again, this may or may not be the way that you would choose to describe it. So that's fine. There's This isn't about right or wrong answers or any sort of quiz or test. But for example, if you're focusing your efforts on people, you might be talking about, for example, um, a, a particular group experiencing a particular issue. So the examples here are women experiencing homelessness, seniors who are isolated or homebound, um, people who are um, immigrants without documentation or families with mixed immigration status. And so if you're 
if your program is focusing on people and and trying to provide specific benefits or change policies to affect them, you might want to scroll through this type of list showing you the kinds of strategies that you could use to provide outreach, um, to promote a, a particular um, issue or access to some kind of service, to promote prevention and respond earlier to prevent things from becoming more acute, to um, intervening in some way, or if there's already been an intervention, maybe you're trying to help somebody maintain progress. And so these are all expandable menus, the ones people, organizations, and systems, which has some similar ideas about where your organization might be focused. So this has some examples like for operations or HR policies and practices, maybe the different ways that you are uh, providing training and technical assistance in forums like this one or mentoring. Maybe you're doing something that's related to the coordination of your work across different partners or across a sector or sharing data like data share aims to do. So each of these has some ideas. And again, if you think your effort is described in one of these categories, but doesn't have quite the right label, that's fine. That's just you know a way of helping you describe what you're doing so that others can understand it. And so that you are able to explore the ways to not just describe, but possibly measure, evaluate, assess what you're doing. And you can see that um, this might be something where for some programs, it's very easy to describe the kinds of strategies that you're using or you've had them in place for a while. And for others, it might take a little bit more work. And so if you are curious about how to use these for something like a theory of change or a logic model, as Nicole said, we have a lot of training in our archives that might be helpful to you. And so um, just consider that if, if you think that would be helpful. And those strategies are these broad categories of activities, but they lead to more specific program outcomes, which in turn are the pieces that contribute to community impacts. So you'll be choosing strategies that focus your efforts in a particular way, but um, you'll also be working on specific outcomes. And those are the ones that deliver the kinds of changes that are a direct result of the strategies and activities that you've implemented. So in program outcomes, which is the next section, if you scroll down, now we're answering the question, is anyone better off? So some outcomes are achievable in the short term and you define that. So maybe it's within a year or a little longer or in the intermediate term, something that happens as a result of achieving your short term outcomes. We tend to think of short-term outcomes as changes that might be of uh, a level of awareness, changes in knowledge or attitudes and beliefs about something, or even a, a change in a skill that someone can gain from your efforts. But the results of those are these intermediate outcomes that they lead to. So building on those kinds of changes in awareness, knowledge, attitudes or beliefs or skills, then somebody might have an actual change in behavior, which doesn't happen overnight usually and takes some time to achieve. And that in turn might also lead to different kinds of changes in status, in health, for example. So if you think about this being placed in a logic model or a theory of change or a program plan, you're basically answering questions about where you're focused, what you're planning to do in terms of your, of your activities and strategies, and what you hope to achieve in the short term and the intermediate term. So just as an example, let's say during COVID, your program experimented with doing things virtually like we're doing right now. These are the kinds of um, trainings and gatherings that we used to do in person and may return to someday, but probably not immediately. But for example, maybe you are somebody who provides um, a health service like uh, mental health counseling or 
um, other kinds of support for people. And you decided to shift into doing that virtually through a telehealth kind of mechanism. So in terms of strategies, you might be employing a different way of working with partners and having to share information or changing some of your infrastructure to do that. But you would also have some changes in your outcomes. You might need to let people know that that's an option for them that wasn't there in the past. You may need to help them change their attitudes about telehealth and if they're skeptical of it. They may need some skills to be able to do that and even some things like a tablet and some specific peer training or support. They may need some other things like broadband to make that possible. So you want to follow your idea of what you're trying to achieve and what's needed to achieve it, but the, the purpose of that in these intermediate outcomes might be to increase access to different kinds of healthcare to make it easier for people to do that. And maybe because of that, somebody is not missing appointments when they used to have to drive through traffic or miss work. Maybe somebody, because of that, has a more consistent way to monitor their glucose levels if they have diabetes or talk to a counselor more frequently than they were able to in the past. So you decide what it is that you're trying to accomplish and what it contributes to and leads to and how you might start tracking that. And that's what this uh, strategies and outcomes uh, set of tables is trying to prompt. So let me stop there and see if anyone has examples that you'd like to share if you've been following along with some of these um, either strategies or short-term and intermediate outcomes. Does anybody have one that was prompted by this list or one that you'd like to share, whether it's on the, these lists or not? You can raise your hand or put a comment in the chat. Or do you have questions about any of what we've just covered? I'm gonna collapse some of these so we can see these together. And Nicole, if I can just add, and actually, can you, would you mind scrolling back down to program outcomes and maybe expanding sure. them again? So again, the idea of this being a menu, we know that some sometimes um, figuring out how to phrase outcomes can be really challenging. And uh, in, you know, sometimes on the, you know, both for the applicant and for the funder to try it, especially like, for the county and city of Santa Cruz, when they're thinking about core investments and collective impact, they're not wanting to say like, okay, everybody has to do the exact same thing and measure the exact same outcomes and use the exact same tools. So they're, you know, they're not trying to force everyone to do that. And yet, if there's so much variation in what's being measured or how outcomes are phrased, it becomes really hard for the funder to say, here's here's the impact that our resources, that our funding is having. And so the menu is just a, a tool that if you're looking for a way to think about how do I clearly convey and phrase an outcome that is realistic to measure, feasible to measure, and will really show what happened as a result of providing a particular service or program, this can give you, these are like starter phrases almost. So you can see that there are ways to phrase outcomes either, for example, increased awareness of, and then anytime you see those brackets, that's where like you would fill in the blank. Increased awareness of, you know, the issue you're working on among whatever population or group you're working with, right? Sometimes outcomes are phrased as, a percent increase or a percent decrease in something. So again, like you can mix and match, you can you know take a starter phrase and customize it to so that it's relevant to your particular program. But these are probably some of the most more some of the more common kind of uh, outcome statements or ways to phrase outcome statements that we could think of. 
And again, certainly if you don't see something in that menu and you think we should add it, we're always open to suggestions. And of course, each of these raises issues that we're going to talk about in our next training about how you actually might collect some of this information, what you do or do not have access to. Um, as Nicole noted, just because we want to know something doesn't mean it's easy to, to find it on DataShare or anywhere else. So that those are things to consider as well. Any questions about the strategies or outcomes or the way you might use them? Does anyone describe their current outcomes in a different way or think of this in a different way than is shown here? Okay, Eduardo saying needs a little time to absorb all this. Yeah, we're, we're throwing a lot at you, <laughs> absolutely. All right, well, let's ponder that during a short break so we can practice our self-care by taking a little time away from screens. If you need a little more water, pet the dog, whatever. Um, we'll come back in 10 minutes and then we'll continue our tour of these tools. And let us know if you think of questions in the meantime, because we'll have some time to answer them as well. Okay, is everyone back? see Kevin. Hello, Kevin. Chris, thanks. Others of you want to just give a, a signal either on screen or use the reactions button that'll help us know that everyone is back and ready. Great. Okay, so the next tool that we're going to cover is called the Continuum of Results and Evidence. You might notice that uh, we're basically using the same core acronym. <laughs> we love our acronyms. Um, and this is another tool that has been developed in collaboration with a lot of input from others as we were kind of testing this idea, vetting it. So uh, it certainly reflects a lot of what Nicole and I know and and ways that we think about things but again it's been developed with a lot of other input and and the main reason why we developed this particular tool is some of you may remember in the first round of core funding the concepts of evidence-based programs and practices was a really central part of that of that request for proposals it is again in the in this uh, funding cycle, but it was a newer concept. Um, the ways that evidence-based programs was defined was left a little room for confusion. And there was just also a lot of fear about, does it have to be evidence-based? You know, is core funding only for things that are evidence-based in the most uh, rigorous Kind of traditionally uh, defined way, meaning that there's been a randomized control trial, <laughs> heavily researched. Um, and so there were a lot of fears and resistance and, and concerns about core funding being, you know, uh, primarily for or that those kinds of uh, traditional rigorous EVPs would somehow be favored over others that were more innovative or emerging or didn't have quite as much data behind them. And that actually was not the original intent of, of the, the mention of EBPs in the first round of core funding. That's actually not how the funding played out. The, there's uh, in the current core contracts, um, all types of programs and practices got funded, not, only, not just the ones uh, that have that rigorous research behind them. But still, because there was so much Kind of confusion or questions or concerns raised around the notion of EVPs, we really wanted to offer a tool that really helps us think about evidence and data in a more nuanced way, to really think about it not just as an either or um, kind of choice, but really think about 
data and evidence and results that exist along a continuum. And so again, anytime that you're doing program planning, trying to develop an evaluation plan or implement evaluation, or you're trying to convey to a funder what you're doing and, and what makes you think it will produce the kinds of outcomes that you're proposing, the continuum can help you think about how you might convey that or what you might need to be ready to develop, you know, in terms of evaluation tools. Or look for, has someone else implemented something similar and what kind of data and evidence is behind it? And that's also connected to the, the last tool that Nicole will talk about in a moment. So this continuum, again, is located on DataShare. So just showing you how to get to it. If you were on the strategies and program outcomes page that Nicole was, was reviewing a moment ago, uh, you'll see a link here to the core continuum of results and evidence. Click on that, it opens up that PDF I was just showing you. Um, and so I'll just walk you through like how to read this. And I'll, as I'm doing that, try to give you some examples of how you might use this or, or think about it as your, the way it, it applies to your own programs. So there's four points on this continuum. Emerging, good idea, effective practice, and evidence-based practice. Those are the names of the four points on the continuum. And we, I mean, we've given them different names. We've aligned the names with the definitions in the Promising Practices database that Nicole will, will review in a moment. Um, we're trying to convey, though, that there isn't an inherent or built-in value to each of these. It's not like we're saying that emerging is somehow less than, like less valuable than an effective practice or an evidence-based practice. It really just has more to do with how much data is available about that. How, how much do you know about the kinds of results or outcomes your particular program or practice or a policy produces? So here's how we are defining those po points in the continuum. Emerging meaning a program, practice, or policy that just hasn't been evaluated yet. But you have some maybe initial anecdotal feedback that's positive. So maybe you've tried out a new idea like, hey, what would happen if we um, offered this new program in a school-based setting, different from offering it as a home visiting program? Like, would the setting make a difference? Let's try out that idea. And maybe you haven't evaluated it. Maybe you don't feel like it's uh, that you have the capacity or resources to evaluate it right away, but you want to see what kind of feedback do people give. Does it, does it seem positive, like you're heading in the right direction? It might tell you, oh, it's worth doing more of that. That might actually put you into this next point on, on the continuum, that it's a good idea. That maybe you start doing some informal evaluation, maybe some satisfaction surveys, maybe just collecting some basic um, kind of outputs, like how many people participated, how many completed something. Um, and that data is giving you some signs that there's uh, some signs of progress and that maybe that's, uh, it's proving to be, just like it says, a good idea. So let's say you have something that you're doing that you have identified or your own informal evaluation data tells you it's a good idea. You might decide that's good enough, that's where you want to stay, don't need to do anything else or anything differently. Maybe you decide, well, let's let's actually take this a step further and see, you know, does it actually, can we um, measure and demonstrate a particular outcome, a specific outcome, like one of the ones that Nicole just reviewed in the strategies and program outcomes menu. So here's where you then might take steps to evaluate something more formally. It's more structured. You're, you really thinking through, okay, what are the questions we're going to ask? How are we going to ask them? At what points is data being collected? So that's what we mean by formally evaluated. And that that produces at least one positive outcome. Your results may or may not be statistically significant, meaning, you know, you may not, it may not rise to the level where you can say, you know, beyond a doubt, okay, this wasn't just a fluke, but you, but you're showing, okay, it does something. And again, you might 
for your own evaluation or by looking at other models and evaluation reports that have been done about a particular program or service, you might decide, you know what, good enough for us. That tells us what we needed to know. We're going to continue evaluating it in this way. We don't feel the need to do anything more than that in terms of producing other or different types of data and evidence. Sometimes it is helpful, it is beneficial, or sometimes other funders do require something that is more along the lines of a traditionally defined evidence-based program or practice. So here we mean a program, practice, or policy that's been studied in one or more rigorous research studies, you know, that adheres to like scientific guidelines or standards. Usually there's a comparison group. So you know, okay, it wasn't just that that particular group of people happened to do well or get the kinds of results that you were hoping for, but you can see compared to a group that didn't get the same service or program or intervention, the group that got it had much better outcomes and that there were statistically significant improvements in at least one outcome. Okay, that's consistent with, so the way that we've defined it, defined these points in the continuum for core, uh, we've made sure that they're consistent with the way that the Promising Praxis database defines the different points in that uh, database that, again, Nicole will describe in a moment. The one difference is in Promising Praxis, you'll notice when you see it that there's not like a corresponding fourth point in their database. So we, we, we use this <laughs> for our own purposes, emerging. Um, but Nicole also described there are ways to add local practices to, prom to this database if they don't quite fit the definition uh, of a good idea, effective practice, or evidence-based practice the way that data share is defining them. But again, we've tried to align, make sure that our definitions align uh, with promising practices. Here in this tool, you'll also see that um, we, we just listed some examples. Again, this isn't saying, oh, you have to do all of these things in order for it to be considered an evidence-based practice or effective practice. These are just examples of what you might consider. Oh, do we just need to get some anecdotal feedback to, and you know, as people leave a class, ask them, hey, what'd you think of that? <laughs> did you like it? What did you like about it? Um, or do you want to be doing something, again, more structured, you know, either tracking activities and participants, you know, doing things like interviews or focus groups or pre and post surveys as a common method? Right. And many of those methods are also used in um, the more rigorous research studies, the difference being that they're set up in a way like they're an experiment, that randomized control trial or some kind of measure to, to be able to say for cert with certainty, this program, this intervention produced that output uh, for this group of people. It wasn't just luck or chance or some other factor. Um, so I'll pause it before I talk about the next piece of this, just to um, give you a chance to think about a program or a service maybe that you're considering applying for with core funding. And think about just based on that definition, that little kind of high level definition I gave, do, does one of these points on the continuum seem to match how you think about your program or practice? In terms of how much evaluation you've done or that it, or that someone else has done how much data exists and why don't we uh why don't we actually use the chat for this think of a program or practice that you're thinking about including in your core proposal and just based on that definition i gave would you consider it an emerging practice or program, a good idea, an effective practice, or evidence-based practice? And then go ahead and put your answer in the chat. This is another one of those areas in the core application where you will, you'll be asked basically that same question. You know, describe the program you're seeking funding for, name a particular you know, model or practice that you're implementing, that you would be implementing with the core funding, 
where does that program or practice fall on the continuum? So you'll have to answer that in your core applications. It's not gonna be scored in a way where like, you know, evidence-based practice gets more points than a good idea. It's purely so that as the county and the city or as the reviewers are reviewing the applications, they have a sense of where you see it falling on this continuum. And if you are thinking, well, I'm not really sure because it's somewhere in between a good idea and effective practice, <laughs> um, just going to use your best judgment about where, which one does it seem most like? Carolyn says, good idea. Great, thanks for that, Carolyn. Eduardo, evidence-based practice as well as effective practice. Chris is saying the foster grandparents somewhere between effective and evidence-based. Yep. Lisa says effective. Yeah. And, you know, I'll just share a, a brief example from a program that I actually coordinate and implement, the Triple P Positive Parenting Program. There have been, like, dozens and dozens of research studies on Triple P, different aspects of it. So it's considered an evidence-based program. There are local adaptations we do of the program, different um, ways that we try to, you know, make the program accessible to our local community that... Some of them really are, we're kind of testing the idea. And I would consider it like, you know, we're taking evidence-based practice, our way that we're adapting and implementing it might be considered a good idea until we measure it enough to then say, okay, yep, that actually, that variation works. And we would consider an effective practice um, based on a rigorously studied evidence-based practice. So again, lots of different ways to think about this um, and use it as a tool. So one other thing we wanted to point out um, about this tool, and I'll just mention also that the link right now to this tool in DataShare will only show you the English version. Uh, it needs to be updated to include the bilingual version and the link that Gisela put in the chat a few moments ago, that actually takes you to the bilingual version. So this is just, this is uh, the second page of the English core continuum, just other ways to think about and help you decide, okay, where on the continuum might it fall, you know, depend on, on how formal the data collection is. You know, is the documentation of the results and evidence going to be found in other places? But really what we wanted to point out, which we think this is what makes the tool really helpful, aside from just naming or identifying where on the continuum something falls, is to use these questions to help you kind of deepen your thinking about program planning and evaluation. So these are some examples of what you might be asking or saying to yourself as you plan or design programs, practice and policies. If it's an emerging practice or program, you might, you might be considering an emerging practice or program because you're saying, oh, the usual approaches just aren't solving the issue. Or you might be asking yourself, I wonder what would happen if we tried this, this variation, this new idea. Maybe you're wanting to know what can we try that hasn't been done before versus in the good idea bucket there. You might be asking or saying things like, well, this approach seems to be reaching the right number and types of people and the informal anecdotal feedback tells us that it's worth continuing. But how, how do we actually know? <laughs> how do we know that this is really a good idea and what data will help us communicate the importance of this approach? Okay, so you might be asking those types of questions uh, if it's a good idea. And then if you're wanting to kind of move up and, and or move to a different point in the continuum, Maybe you do want to move from a good idea to effective. And so you might be saying, you know, this approach seems to work. It's been evaluated, you know, in other places and produced similar outcomes. Um, but again, how, how do we know it will work with our population in our community? Or uh, what, again, what other data do we need to convey why this approach works uh, for, the, for the people that we're working with? 
If you're wanting to really consider an evidence-based program or practice, you might find yourself saying things like, uh, research shows that this program or practice or policy has improved the same or similar outcomes that we're interested in that are in our logic model. But again, how, how will we know it works in a different setting or with a different population? It worked in that research setting, will it work here locally? Uh, and again, what data do we need that will help us understand and convey why this works, why it's important, you know, who it works for and, and in what conditions? And then when you've actually gathered the kind of data or results or evidence that we've mentioned in each of these points on the continuum, you might find yourself then at that point asking different questions, more questions. So in the emerging practices, you might find yourself saying, well, should we keep doing this? And if so, how much more? Um, or should we do more? And what other, again, data or evidence do we need for our own purposes and really to be contributing to this evidence base? On the good idea points on the continuum, you might be asking yourself, so would this work? This is a great good idea. We've got some data to show that. Would it work on a broader scale for more people in different situations for a longer period of time? What data do we need to show that for our own purposes and add to the evidence base? Whereas an effective practice, again, once you have some data, you might be asking a different set of questions. Are there other and enough evaluation studies that have been done with an equity lens to support our statement that this works? Can we, how confident can we be that this particular intervention or program or approach would improve the outcomes that we're interested in versus it's some other factors or causes that are creating that outcome? And again, have others used a similar approach, gotten the same kinds of results? What data and evidence do we need to be collecting? And then on the evidence-based point on the continuum, again, asking yourself a different set of questions once you've found some data, either your own or others. Again, asking yourself, are there enough of these kinds of research studies with an equity lens that give us that confidence to say, this intervention, this approach works, if we adopt an evidence-based program or practice that was researched somewhere else, do we think we're likely to get, or did we get comparable results given the different context of our local community? And again, what other data or evidence should we be collecting and reviewing for our own purposes and to add to the data, to the evidence base? So you'll see a lot of these tools are really meant to be, um, to offer some guiding questions so it's not just like a hard and fast prescriptive, oh, you can only call yourself something if you <laughs> clearly fall in that column, but really then to, again, deepen the thinking, involve others in the planning, in the thinking to really understand, you know, what data do you have? What data do you need? How will you go about collecting that, analyzing that, how, you know, sharing that with others? I'll pause at this point to see, are there any questions about the core continuum, the structure of it, how you might use it? Seems like several of you could, uh, to, could pinpoint one or two points on that continuum where some of your programs and practices fall. So that will be helpful. Again, that's something you'll have to be prepared to do in your core applications. And then really, again, the, the scoring of applications isn't based on what point on the continuum you are, but like how well and how completely you're able to describe then, again, the data you have or that you plan to collect and have that be consistent with what point on the continuum you've identified. Okay, any other questions or just comments or reactions about the core continuum? Yes, Eduardo, just another, yeah, good reminder. It's just, you know, a lot of these tools, we're, uh, we're giving you the brief overview and tour of them. And then certainly encourage you to keep going back in there and practicing and, and using them and 
there are certain more questions will come up once you start doing that. So feel free to, again, either ask us or come back to office hours, you know, future office hours sessions or other trainings and keep working through it. Okay, so Nicole, I think I will turn it back over to you for the Promising Practices database. Okay. So here's my screen again, hoping everybody can see that all right. So just for the purpose of repetition and uh, learning that way, so the core results menu is under local progress. And the Promising Practices database is a link in some places, but also is easy to get to from the Resources tab. So I'm going to go there right now. So as Nicole mentioned earlier, DataShare as a platform is maintained by the Healthy Communities Institute uh, or Conduent, HCI Conduent. And that means that we are one, we, Santa Cruz County, are one of 150 or so other counties around the country that have something similar to this. So an advantage of that is that HCI, the Healthy Communities Institute, um, gathers data sets all over the place. And if there is something that is applicable to everyone, um, we see it first. And the, they also collect information on promising practices. So they have a combination of local uh, practices and we're allowed to submit something kind of for consideration to be placed on here, or they share information from other places. So you'll see, if you go to the promising practices database, you'll see promising practices from all over, which is a real advantage um, because there are often things that are happening um, you can see on this page, for example, it's targeted some these three local things, which it considers, you know, Northern California, San Francisco, and Santa Cruz County to all be local. And then it goes into a whole list of things alphabetically. And so, like many listy kinds of things, this is going to have thousands, hundreds, and potentially thousands of results. And so one of the things we want to do is use this database to advantage. If you're a um, go down the rabbit hole, explore until you get to a dead end. Um, Kevin, it sounds like you did a little of that earlier. Um, if, that's your, if that's your jam, this is a great spot for you. But if it's not, and you want to do something more targeted, this can still um, reward a little bit of effort in trying to filter and structure your search. So as Nicole mentioned, these rankings, and we, we really, we personally really want to get away from that language of, of levels or value or worth that ranking implies. We, that, we really use that continuum idea. So just ignore the word ranking here. That's, a, that's an HCI thing, not a core thing. But it's, they're, they're actually at the same kind of, uh, when you get into these, it's the same kind of idea that you may or may not have data available. It doesn't mean that it's better or worse. It just means you know more. Um, there's a place on here right above this orange submit a promising practice where they, they explain their ranking methodology for how they um, use these terms and what goes where. So if that's of interest to you, it's very similar to what Nicole just described. And as she mentioned, the core um, continuum aligns very closely with this. It just has that fourth emerging category as well as the good ideas, effective practices, and evidence-based practices. So they do um, line up. We have been able to submit um, a lot of the local examples for inclusion here. Um, we understand that we're one of the most active um, HCI clients in doing that. So this is um, a, a part of data share that is probably going to get a lot more robust over time, but kind of in fits and starts. So if you don't see something here, it just means that it hasn't gone through this process. You may have um, access to other sorts of clearing houses that compile similar kinds of programmatic data. Maybe there's something that's specific to your field or your the topic area that you're working in. So again, by all means, if you have another place to go to look for these kinds of ideas and examples, 
go there, but this is just trying to make it easier for you to have things in one place that are um, easily searched. It's just not the most comprehensive yet. So um, depending on what you're looking for, you may or may not find um, something that's helpful to you. So just give it a try and see what comes up. So um, I'll just do a little bit of um, searching with you and show you how this could work. There are, let's say I'm interested in um, something to do with homeless services. So I'm gonna type in homeless as an option and hit search. So now I've gone from about 2,500 um, items in this database to about 90. And I can see one that's local, the Homeless Garden Project, and then some from other parts of the country. But 90 is still a lot for me to wade through. So I'm gonna see if I can do something maybe with women or older adults. Um, I could also choose one of these categories of practice. I could only look at something that's local or only something that's in a national guide like the CDC community guide. For those of you um, who aren't familiar, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, compiles um, a guide to different kinds of interventions and programs that's very rig rigorously vetted with a, a committee that considers all the data and studies about a particular intervention. So that's what that's referring to. If some things other people looked at, that it's met some, um, some tests of the types of data that are collected and what you can predict about outcomes of implementing that program. There are also some topics and subtopics that you can choose from, and some of these have extensive drop-down menus. Like in health, you could pick many, many, many dimensions of what you're interested in. But I'm just going to go, I'm going to see what happens when I do uh, just the, the filters for women and older adults, and then I'll hit search again. Now I've gone from 2,500 initially to 91 to 16. So this feels a little bit more doable to start looking at. And now I can see some brief descriptions and I can see what other areas this might be filed under. And this is these are tags that, that HCI places on these programs. I can see where this program was originally developed and implemented and this first one would be in Chicago, Illinois. And I can just scroll through and see what catches my eye. So let's say that while I'm interested in homeless services and I'm interested in services for women and particularly older women, I'm also really interested in diabetes because chronic diseases are so hard to manage even in the best of times, but especially if you don't have routine access to shelter, um, to care, and if you're living uh, rough, this is a, a much more difficult disease to manage even um, th than any other situation. And so I wanna know more about that. So I might say, I did not know that there was a diabetes management program specifically for people who are homeless. I'm interested in this, it's in Kansas City. So I'm gonna click on it. And now I'm gonna get a little more detail about this program. So a description, its goal or mission. This is something that was submitted to uh, the data share platform, presumably by someone in Kansas, but maybe by someone else who used this program. So the data here, I'm, I'm getting some information about outcomes that they've tracked. That might give me some ideas about what I wanna track in my proposed project. But I'm also noticing that these data are getting to be a decade old. And so I might wanna just contact them and see if there's been an update to this because HCI might not update each of these programs. It might or might not even be in existence. Up here with related promising practices, I can click on some other programs that are related to diabetes, to self-management, there's that CDC community guide I was just mentioning. So there are a bunch more rabbit holes that I could go down just on this page. But if I keep scrolling down, 
I also have some related content that the DataShare platform is offering to me. So I might wanna look at specific indicators and see if these are things that are relevant to the program I'm proposing. Here's some data that's specific to Santa Cruz County that might have something that I could use. Here's a funding opportunity from the National Institutes of Health that I didn't know about. Maybe I'll click on that. Maybe I wanna look at some other reports related to homelessness or health status or even to violence prevention that might particularly affect the people in the cohort that I'm interested in working with. And then there's some toolkits that DataShare thinks I should check out. So as Nicole mentioned earlier, when you're looking at indicators on DataShare, there are a number of ways to slice and dice and search for them. There's just no substitute for getting in here and seeing what works for you and your program. But building a dashboard is a really helpful tool. There's a tutorial within DataShare for doing that. You can uh, assemble, kind of curate some of the indicators and data and use them in different ways in a slide deck or a report or sharing information with colleagues. So just that one uh, thread that I pulled of searching for programs that are uh, relevant to homeless women with diabetes gave me a lot of directions I could go in to explore. So again, some of this will be straightforward for the things that you're thinking about, and some of it might require quite a bit more digging, maybe enjoyable digging, maybe frustrating digging, but there's just a lot here that you can only learn about if you spend a little time with it. So um, what kinds of things might based on that description might be a, a search that you would do. Let's do a couple searches together, or maybe you've done one already while I've been talking and would like to share that. Does anybody have something they'd like to pursue? Or maybe you'd rather do this on your own when you have a little more space and time, totally fine. Kevin, would you be willing to share with us what you came across earlier when we were looking at the core results menu and you and you ended up in the promising practices database? Uh, sure, yeah. I mean, I guess I was in, so I was kind of following through, what were we in? I was following along with your example of, I think we we're in the community or in health and wellness um and then i ended up just searching for local uh programs and you know doing something having to do with economy and education uh and found the homeless garden project which is a program that i know pretty well here um and yeah just kind of did some reading up on them um it was pretty, it, it seemed like that maybe was pretty limited locally in terms of like searching locally, but then expanding it, um, kind of like toggling back and forth between, you know, adding in the CDC guidelines and, and new programs can expand that, that search. That's what I was looking at before. I've now gone down a different rabbit hole, but. <laughs> that sounds familiar. <laughs> Lots of rabbit holes. Does anybody else want to share their, their trail of breadcrumbs? Well, if you, if you haven't had a chance to, um, just we really encourage you to spend more time with, with different parts of data share. Um, use what works for you and um, let us know if you have additional questions as you do that. So you've got, yes, Eduardo, lots of rabbit holes as well. Carolyn, did you come on camera to, to share something or just to say hi? Um, well, I, I was, yeah, just looking a little bit. Um, so Senderos has a program that did kind of really emerge out of the pandemic of um, this Plaza Communitaria, which is um, 
like a community resource gathering of, you know, mostly parents, um, some teens, and, um, you know, doing computer literacy and bringing in a lot of speakers from other community organizations, um, you know, to access, to help families access resources. So I was trying to, I was just looking at those limited categories and trying to think like, how would I search for something like that? Mm -hmm. And I wasn't sure <laughs> because it, you know, I put in adults and then I put in education, but um, it seems like that's more targeted to, um, you know, literacy or, yeah. So, so what okay. ideas do people have for Carolyn? What would you search for if you were trying to look at the, the connection that the group is trying to foster? So Carolyn, I have one suggestion for you. Mm -hmm. And I just tested it to see, to make sure it wouldn't give me a whole zero. <laughs> but I wondered if a term like social capital mm -hmm. might give you some things to think about. Okay. Just because, and this is not something that's, that you would necessarily see here, but just because that's something that looks at building up a sense of trust and reciprocity and connection. And those are some of the ways that people try to measure the, the connection, community connectedness um, dimensions. Yeah, we done, did some work um, with some social workers around empathy and building empathy and yeah, trust in the group and yeah, mm -hmm. building a supportive community. I mean, maybe some um, some of the things that Cradle to Career are doing also in Live Oak, yeah. Well, and this might be one where if you wanna go back and forth, you might wanna look, for example, at the thriving families or community connectedness um, indicators that are on the results menu. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Does anybody else have suggestions or other ideas? Think things you'd be interested in pursuing? One thing that is, I guess I just wonder what, well, really anyone here's thoughts might be about um, some of the, oh gosh, what is this dashboard called? The metrics, um, just like when you're searching through the, the menu. Um, I'm trying to get back to that main menu, but the- The, the indicators in the core yeah. results menu? Yeah, the core results menu, that was what, what I was trying to think of. Um, I guess it's interesting clicking on some of them, like uh, the at least the little like icons that show the data like um, appear, like there's a little meter that's, you know, in the, in the green or the yellow or the red. And um, many of them, at least the ones that I'm looking at, are quite good for Santa Cruz compared to other counties. Um, and so I guess it's just, I'm just kind of interested in, like, obviously, the, even if they're good, they could be better if that, you know, if you have a program that is specifically addressing one of those categories where there's data and it's just giving you data to think about. Um, and, you know, perhaps that's like a, a sort of like a mile marker of like, well, if it's at 30%, it could get to 15% of families living in poverty or something like that. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't know, I guess it's just interesting to think about, like there are a lot of, uh, of those indicators on that dashboard that are pretty, um, I guess it just kind of is like, oh, we're doing pretty good. So I can see an organization looking at that and going, oh, I guess like this isn't really a high priority because mm -hmm. there are other things that are in the red or, you know, where we're in the lower 50% as a county uh, or the, you know, yeah, I guess. Well, Kevin, it's a great point. And 
you know, one of the reasons that we, when Nicole mentioned that when you look at some of those indicators, you can disaggregate them or look at them in a more uh, detailed way by zip code or geography or race or ethnicity or age or these other, what we call the, the equity dimensions, you might find that that above average for the state or doing relatively well indicator is masking some real differences in like overall student achievement is fine, but maybe a particular group of students is not fine. Um, same for almost any indicator that you could pick. There are often differences that just don't show up until you start pulling back that curtain and really looking at some of those um, more specific contributors to the, the aggregate point that, you know, overall things seem fine. That's not always the case, but often. And another difficulty is that sometimes we just don't have um, the specific data that tell us about where those gaps and inequities and differences are. But um, there's more and more of it available. And as Nicole mentioned, when she showed the way to get the list of the indicators and some of the, um, the types of variations that you might have access to on data share, you will see that a lot of them do have um, some of that. And if, if they don't, um, one, of the, one of the ways that HCI works is that as more and more communities get interested in those kinds of, of dimensions of the data, there's more pressure to provide it that way. And so different kinds of things might, might appear in either our own um, data sets by request or um, for all of the HCI uh, data platform customers, you know, who, who are interested in that. So I guess the message of that is keep, if you, there's something you don't see, keep checking and also um, consider making a request for the types of data that are missing that are important to you. But thanks for bringing that up. It's really, really an important way to understand what you're seeing there. Your other questions or observations? I'm seeing some action in the chat here about, let's see, Christina was denied access to the first five evaluation report. I think it's just an outdated or, or broken link. Oh, a broken link. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that kind of thing too, just um, let us know so we can pass it along or there are ways to submit problem tickets directly to DataShare too. Yeah, actually, if you notice anything like after this training, um, there's a contact us option in the site. That's probably the best thing because then it can go directly to under about us, contact us. Um, so Christina, we'll let, we'll let the data share team know about the one that you mentioned, but if anyone else finds things that are funky or <laughs> leading to nowhere or have a suggestion about a data point to add, this would be the a great way to submit that. Those won't go to us because we would just be passing them on to someone else. All right, well, let me move to our closing. We have another poll for you. You should be seeing on your screens. And now we just want to know how likely you might be to use each of these tools as you're preparing your, your core uh, proposals and applications. And the options are very likely, somewhat likely, not very likely, or not at all likely, or you're just not sure if you don't know. And there's one for each of the tools we went over today. So if you just keep scrolling down, you'll see four questions. One for the results menu, 
one for the strategies and program outcomes menu, and then the core continuum and the promising practices database. And it looks like at least the people who've answered are very likely to use the core results menu, mostly likely to use strategies and program outcomes. A little drop off in the core continuum, but still very or somewhat likely. And similar for promising practices. All right, great. Well, thanks everyone for letting us know that. We also wanted to let you know what's coming up next. So this um, training that you've just listened to will be um, repeated on the 16th and in the morning though, so different time, but same content if you have other colleagues who might be interested. Um, and as you know, these are being recorded in both English and Spanish. So that's another option for people who can't attend. We are holding um, on Friday morning um, office hours that we'll just do our best to answer your questions as you bring them to us. Um, there's one from 10 to 11 and a second one from 11.30 to 12.30. We also um, will come back after a bit of a break um, in December to do a workshop. Um, actually, the Human Services Department is doing a workshop on Reviewer, and that's the online platform through which the, um, the core RFP applications will be submitted, and that will be on January 12th. And then we'll do um, a, a pair of trainings that are similar to this one that have to do with using some of these tools in different ways. And we're gonna do a deeper dive on the, that second week of January on the 11th and the 13th, a longer three hour training about refining some of the program outcomes like the ones we talked about today using uh, an equity lens and how to use evaluation tools in, in a similar way with equity focused evaluation. And then we'll come back the following week with a pair of uh, trainings, different times, same content on some ideas about how to use data to tell your story um, and to keep learning about what you're doing along the lines of the continuum. What do we wanna know? How do we learn it? And then we'll have another set of, of office hours throughout January. So lots going on and um, an individual one-on-one -on -one TA for, for you or a small group by request. So you can sign up for that as well. So we, we hope to see you one way or another at um, one or more of these events. And we also really, because we're doing these all the time, we really do appreciate and learn from your feedback and hope that you'll answer one more poll, a survey on the format of today's session and what you learned. And uh, especially because we're doing this again, just a couple days, we would really appreciate your feedback on this. So we'll hang out for a little bit if you have some, any other lingering questions, but again, just please um, use what you can from these tools if it's helpful to you. And if it's not, not to worry. We are um, very hopeful that this will be useful rather than intimidating or overwhelming. And do um, spend, if this is brand new to you, do spend a little time with it. Um, it, will, it will be rewarded because it, it, we know this is a ton of information to process in real time. And so just sit with it for a bit and hope that it's helpful to you as you move forward. I have a quick question. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. Um, when we're submitting our applications, if we're um, referring to data on data share, can we just refer to that data as fact? Do we have to source it as getting it from data share? How do we justify the, the data that we're putting in the application? I think it's a good idea to cite it. If you got it, for, if you got it off of data share, um, probably so the whoever's reviewing the proposals may or may not know, they may or may not be familiar with data share. So they might see a statistic and wonder, hmm, where did that come from? Is that really <laughs> reliable? So if you cite it, it just gives it that added sense of like, okay, that came from somewhere. It wasn't just a, you know, and then if someone did want to go check it or they were really curious about it, there would be a. 
you know, I would, citation there. I would agree just because data share itself contains a lot of different sources. So some things come from a large data set, some things are less or are more local or um, some things are collected, you know, through a, through a survey or, um, and some things are collected through administrative data like hospital admission. So they're just different, there are lots of different things on data share and, and a reviewer can't track all, all the hundreds of things on there. So just give them a, give them a guide about what, why you find that data compelling and where it comes from. Okay. Would, would serve you well, yeah. In, in, any, in any proposal, not just this one. <laughs> 